to into a bar and they have like this rack overhead where you put all your jackets, right? So you wear all your jackets, you get inside the bar, you take them all off and you can put it on top of this rack. And then by the end of the night, everybody's drunk as fuck. And then everybody takes a different jacket back home and they have a Facebook group specifically for this. You know, it's like, oh, hey guys, yeah. there's this pink woolly jacket. Whose is it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's fairly normal. <laughs> like one of the clubs I go to, they had this uh, Lost and Found album the other day and it really made us laugh because there was someone's underwear there. As you do in the club, you know. So of course, that, that was really that one was really funny because I remember I can't remember how the underwear looked, but it made everyone go like, "What? Like, okay, all right." Well, at least someone had a good time. Yeah, apparently so. <laughs> Hi everyone, Rindo here, and welcome to Living It Up in Lion City. The following episode is a conversation I had with a good friend of mine who is a Singaporean living in Estonia. We had a catch up way back in February, right at the cusp of the COVID crisis going global. It seems like a lifetime ago. Enjoy the expo- episode, folks. Hello and welcome to yet another awesome episode of Living It Up in Lion City, a podcast about life in Singapore where friends and I talk about what goes on in this little red dot we call home. With me here is a good friend of mine who I recorded a podcast episode with all the way last year, <laughs> but because my audio sucked, I couldn't use that footage, but um, you know, she is here with me once again. So without further ado, Nikki, welcome back. Hello. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I hope this works this time. It does. It does. <laughs> <laughs> Fingers crossed. Um, Nikki, you know, uh, thanks for you know being part of this again. Of course, <laughs> you know? gotta support your friends, man. <laughs> gotta support your friends. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so, Nikki, so before we get started, like, could you tell us a little bit about you know yourself, you know, what you're doing, where you currently live, etc. Okay, so right now I currently live in Tallinn, Estonia, which uh, well, it's in Europe. Please, uh, you know, get that in your heads. <laughs> I get this all the time. Um, I do marketing. That's what I work in. And I was a digital nomad for about four years, backpacking all around. And uh, that's even, I think I met Rindo even before that through Couchsurfing because we all love travel. Um, so I take my backpack. I go, I work on my laptop. I think I was freelancing before it was even cool. Back in 2009 where you Try not to say that you're a freelancer because people look down on that massively, especially in Singapore. It was a bit hard you, to yeah. explain. Yeah, I remember you mentioned that there was a stigma associated with yeah, freelancing it, back then. Yeah, it was. And like, I was just like, look, I do marketing work. And they're just like, well, you don't have a stable pay. How does that work? And it was just kind of like, you know, bad. It's a lot better these days, but still not the way I hope it to be. Okay. Um, but yeah, and uh, I was a dancer before. I love food massively. Um, still love my traveling, although it gets me down. Love my couch surfing people and my friends. We do awesome barbecues here. That's true. She <laughs> makes amazing chicken. Like oh, yeah, yeah. Nikki's that. Chicken yeah. has a Facebook page. <laughs> Let me add that one. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Nikki, like, tell us about like how did you end up in Estonia? Okay, so that is a very simple answer. I actually got a job. So I was looking for a job in the EU and I just looked at um, this startup called Jobatical. They no longer do like cross-border jobs. They've sort of pivoted how what they're doing right now. But back then they were and I was looking like, okay, are there any marketing jobs that say that um, they will provide visas? Because there's no use applying for one that doesn't. Right. And then I got one. So that was quite interesting. And uh, it was a job in Estonia and I was like, oh, okay, um, cool. It's in the EU. All right, let's go. And the job was doing marketing for Latitude 59, which is the main tech and startup conference in Estonia. So I did their marketing in 2018. It was a four-month contract job, which I thought was great because I wasn't sure like, oh my goodness, am I going to pack my whole entire life there? All of a sudden, you know, after backpacking and stuff, it's a bit hard. But I thought four months is a good like period to have a little taste of it. And then uh, I really liked it. So I applied for another job there. And then that's the one I've been with for a year and a half now. Awesome. Yep. Awesome. Um, how has your experience been in Estonia so far? Um, very interesting, actually. The startup scene itself is nothing like I've ever seen before. I mean, whenever I backpack around, I like to go to meetups and just, you know, just have a look at what's going on. But Estonia really shocked me. 
um, Skype was created by two Estonians, and that's something wow, that not okay. a lot of people know. Didn't know that. Two yeah. guys decided that we want to change the world, and we're going to do something about it. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I mean, unfortunately, Microsoft <laughs> bought Skype, and God knows where they are now, which I'm a bit upset about. But uh, even that shocked me to find out that Skype started in Estonia. And also, um, I think Estonia has about four unicorns right now, and unicorns are like startups that have, like, I think, almost a billion euros in funding. So in Estonia only has 1.4 million people. So right. per capita, they literally have the most unicorns per capita. Interesting. Yeah. Is this the case in the, I mean, like across the European Union? Not really. I'm not sure about that. I probably need to research, but okay. I know like innovation in Estonia is absolutely crazy. Uh, TransferWise is also by Estonians in case oh, you didn't okay. know that. Wow. Another two people who, two or four, I can't remember now, who decided we want to change the world and they have with TransferWise. It's, have you used it, Rindo? Uh, I have I have heard of it. I haven't. Okay, used yeah. That Unfortunately, yet. it's not available for the Indian currency at the right. moment, and that's okay. you know a bit sad. Um, but uh, transfer-wise, like they came up to change the banking scene basically because they're like, why are you paying so much in currency exchange and why are you paying so much in bank transfers? And they have actually changed the way it's done. I can transfer super fast, super easily. And the exchange rate is so competitive. It's absolutely crazy. And the transfer fees are like, what, 25% or less than a traditional bank as well. So you actually pay a lot less because you don't lose on the currency exchange as well. So that's transfer wise. And then there's pipe drive that does like customer relationship management. There's another one called Bolt. They used to be called Taxify and they're like a competitor to Uber. Okay. And they also have like a billion euros right now and get this man. It's run by a pair of brothers and I think they're like, 2737 or 2838, something like that. Puts us all to shame, man. Wow. And they are super cool. Like, they all try to give back to the startup scene each time. So the startup scene with its innovation and how much people support each other has been, like, one of the most amazing things I've seen in Estonia. Even the government, um, they have this section called Startup Estonia. And they really provide a lot of support. Like, uh, there's the startup visa for people and things like that. And um, it's interesting how, like, as much as they give the support, they don't control the scene because they know that you nobody can control the scene. You know, the startup scene goes up and down, up and down right. all the time. It goes to the high heavens, it crashes down and burns, and it's just meant to be like that. And it's amazing to see a government give so much support, yet almost not demand any control. You just want to, like, get some, um, what do you call that, branding and also be like, you know, like sponsorship mentions right. that like, oh, we did this and that. And it's, wow, the innovation has been really amazing. So entrepreneurship is like a big part of It's a the, big thing there. They yeah. even have accelerators for kids. Kids go build robots at the age of like six or something. They tell the kid, um, use this cardboard box and decorate it. And it's your robot. Now tell us what it can do. And it's up to the kid to imagine what the robot can do. It's And they take the robot home after that kind of thing. It's not a real robot. It's just a box. But then... You know, you they do that to the kids. They're like workshops and stuff. It's like, I think when I did Latitude 59 2018, there was a little kid who was like 11 and he started going like, yeah, my mom is like uh, one of the founders at these really good startups. And uh, I said I wanted to create this school bag and it has this and this and this. And my mom was like, do it. And so the kid's on stage telling people what he intends to do with his school bag. It has like, That's you know, tracking really abilities and things like that. <laughs> like, it's... There's also like I think a 16 year old recently who got a decent amount of money to do like a education um, gamification kind of app, okay. teaching kids about math to teach them that like math is like something you need to know every day and it's not that hard. And he's got like was it three thousand users already around the world because kids just learn math by like playing his game, and he's like wow. 16. I mean, do you find this different from the startup scene here in Singapore? I haven't seen the startup scene here for a long time, so it's okay. a bit hard to say. But a few of the startups I work for were definitely, I felt a bit more restrictive, but it's right. kind of dependent as well. But I also heard from a friend recently that when it comes to funding over here, it's really hard to get people to like fund you. Whereas like in Estonia, I think it's, I wouldn't say like easy peasy, but if you have something decent... They're pretty okay to like open their wallets and be like, you know, like the VCs, the venture capitalists are pretty open to be like, okay, you've got a decent viable idea. You've got the MVP, which is a minimum viable product. And then be like, okay, let's see what it can do. So it's pretty interesting. And one of the startups is like, yeah, man, Ashton Kutcher gave us 8 million. And he did. Wow. He gave okay. them 8 million because uh, they're doing this online verification uh, kind of software 
where it like verifies people against their passports and things like that. And one of their aims is to try to prevent human trafficking because of that. Okay. So Ashton Kutcher was like, all right, here's 8 million. Right. So it's not just about like... Um you know, stuff related to tech. There's also a lot of, like, social and entrepreneurship, are, I guess. There's a little bit around. I haven't seen too much. But they try to, like, bunch out. There's, like, education, online verification. It's all, like, technology-based, but it's not just tech stuff. It's, like, right. they go out and, you know, do different things. Yeah. So, like, I did talk to someone who was an ex-entrepreneur, um, you know, and I do chat with them regularly. And one of the things that he said was that over here, in order to get funding, um, like, so he used to have a startup in Spain and then here in Singapore. And then he was like, in Spain, I mean, to put it crudely, he said that, you know, VC funding is a lot easier to get because yeah. uh, they're, they're willing to put out money for a good or promising idea. Yep. Whereas here in Singapore, there's a tendency to look at ROI. And, yes, you yes. you know, like how long it would take to, you know, get that return, yeah. so to speak. So, I don't know, like, do you That's feel what that my difference? F- I'm not, I don't really know the side of VC funding here, but I met a guy the other day who really told me he was like, VC funding here is crazy. And that's exactly what your contact said as well. That he told me, he's like, you can't just have an idea that over here, they'll even ask you, do you have any customers yet? I'm like, you barely have an MVP. This person is probably doing this on the side even. And they go like, oh, your CEO is not fully invested in this. I'm like, how can he be if he's got no money? He has to eat, right? He's got rent to pay, you know? (laughs) So um, I heard about that and I was like, oh, okay. And then he said that he wants to go to Estonia to see what he can try because the same thing, they would be more willing to open their wallets in that sense. But I mean, you still have to prove something proper. Of course. I mean, if it's a good idea, sure. Yeah, you have have a proper plan and things like that. But I heard that over here, just having that even doesn't really work for you very well, which was a bit shocking for me. Oh, well, I mean, it is early days. I think there's been a lot of, you know, government initiatives and initiatives from like private parties, you know, to just Yeah, but it, it, but still as well, like, it's, I don't know. It it's a bit time, of a tough of course, scene, yeah. yeah. I feel like, you know, I think Estonia is probably well ahead of the curve in that respect. Yeah, I mean, they do get funding fairly easily there, but that's also because they make sure that they have something proper. Of course, yeah. of course. So, um, you know, the startup and tech scene aside, like, tell us a bit about your life in Estonia, you know, like living there, you know, the social scene there. (laughs) Honest to goodness, (laughs) um, very honestly, I make less than half of what I would in Singapore, even after the euro to Singapore dollar conversion. And I feel that my quality of life is like a hundred times better over there. Like, I wish I could show you my apartment I have a 47 square meter apartment that is five minutes outside the old town. I have a very nice fireplace. I've got everything I want in the apartment, you know. Fireplace is still a thing? Wow. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got some wood from my friend the other day for free, so thank God for that. (laughs) And I have a sauna because my landlord is Finnish, so I have a sauna in my bathroom. Uh, But everything's a good size. Even my mom was like, she came to visit me and she saw my apartment because they've seen videos, but they haven't seen the place. And she was like whoa so this is how you live i'm like yep this is how i live um yeah asian food is not the best over there i must say but uh in june 2019 there was a thai shop that opened and i'm best friends with the owner or like the the chef so it's really cool i get my sort of asian fix from there um yeah, social life. I mean, you know, I go out to the clubs, I hang out at the bars, just that most of us will stay away from the old town because that's where all the tourists go and the bars there just play top 40s kind of music and we're just like so over that. Which is fair. Which is yeah, fair. Um, yeah. There, there's like some really cool areas. You just have to know where to go. And uh, I've brought like foreigners there and they're like, what? This is so cool. And yeah, wow. it, you know, you get to know the city, you get to know the people. People do say that Estonians can be a little like closed off and cold and stuff. Um, I guess it does happen like that. But for most of the people I've met, they've been really nice to me. I remember you said something the last time where it was like, you know, um, like as a stranger in a strange land, you do have to put yourself out there, you know? So it's like, yes, you, do. you can't just go to some place and then expect to make friends no, and then of whinge course. about it because, you know, you don't exactly any like you have to make what it is. Right. for yourself you know no one's gonna come knock on your door and be like yep. hey you want to be friends i mean you did a similar thing when you came here as yeah, well absolutely. it's not easy at first and it's tiring as hell to do it but, but that's that's what you have to do you have you know? to do yeah. and you have to find your scene 
like uh, there was a chick that told me like oh Estonia is just so boring you know and I don't party and I'm like you don't have to party there's like hiking groups table tennis um badminton beach volleyball because we have this indoor place with sand because we don't have no sun no nothing right right but, you course. know people people go <laughs> and they play beach tennis indoors you know so I'm like have you put yourself out there to find something you know whereas for me like I like my techno music. I found my crew and they keep introducing me to more people and it's just gone on like that. And then I just go like, oh, anybody wants like real Asian food or something? They're like, oh yeah, absolutely. I'm like, well, I'm going to make some. You guys want to come? And so they come and then I introduce them to the food and they're really happy. And then, you know, it goes on like that. And so I'm curious, like, so if you were to give advice to someone moving to Estonia for the mm -hmm. first time, like, you know, I mean, let, let's face it, you know, you are quite the extrovert, so it wouldn't be too much of an issue for you to find your crew, it so to speak. It took me a while as oh, well, though. Okay. Like, when I first got there, it took me about three months or so before, like, I was like, okay, I'm not just hanging out with work people, and I really found, like, what I was wanting in terms of a social life. Right. So it does take time because the weather affects people there as well. And I moved in like winter, so nobody really wants to be going out at that time. Everybody just wants to stay at home, including yourself. So I remember on Valentine's Day, you remember our friend Christina? Yep. yep. Okay, so on Valentine's Day, her husband was traveling somewhere. So she and I actually got on Skype and had a drink together. Okay, You know. all right. And that's kind of like, you have to do things like that. If you need some support, you know, you got to get it from your friends and be like, guys, I need help. So I told her, like, it's Valentine's Day. I'm kind of, like, really lonely. And she's like, oh, yeah, I'm not doing anything either. That's just, um, it's 9 p.m. your time, 8 p.m. my time, because we're one hour ahead. And she's like, well, let's grab out the beer and I have a drink online so we're not so lonely, both of us. I'm like, okay, that's cool. Wow. So we had a Valentine's Day beer together, and that was really nice. I didn't realize that people don't go out during winter. I mean... Not really. Like, it's just more of, like, people uh, people change when it's summer. Okay. Yeah. I yeah. Can, I can imagine. <laughs> so what advice would I give to someone? I would be like, you need to look for what it is that you kind of want. For example, if you're into art, then look for the art, look for the artists, look for the people who are into art. Um, you know, look at what it is that you're into. And uh, there's always like couchsurfing meetups, there's meetup.com. There's now this chick that does like international meetups and things like that. Okay. So, you know, you have to go and put yourself out there and you have to like not give up. There are people I thought I would be friends with at the start. In the end, they didn't like reply me on Facebook and things like that. I was like, okay, fine. I'm just going to find more people then. You know, you have That's to keep going yeah. and trying. Yeah. And uh, it's interesting to see that the expat Facebook groups in Europe can be really crazy. So anything you see in the expat groups in Europe, don't take it to heart entirely. Because a lot of them tend to troll. It's kind of stupid. Like how so? I mean, uh, with like, respect um, to Estonia. Yeah, like depending on what people ask about, you will have those that will give you legit advice and you have those that troll. So it's a bit stupid. Interesting. Yeah, with the expat. And I've seen that because I joined the expat group in Berlin as well. I don't know why I did, but I did. And um, I see the exact same thing going on. And because there's way more expats in Berlin, it's on a much larger scale. Right. So you just, I don't know why it is about these people. You just have to be careful. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, in, in Singapore, I mean, so the expat Singapore Facebook groups, for example, I find it not very representative of life in Singapore in general. So it's oh, like, yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, I, so it's like I've, I've struggled with. So it's like when I first moved to Singapore, it was something similar. You know, of course, you know, I need to find someone who can tell me more about the rent situation, for example. Right. So the expat Facebook groups tend to work the best. But then, like, the more I hang around with that group, the more I realize how little they actually know about mm -hmm. Singapore, you know? So that's when I started branching out and then I'm like, I'm all the better for it. Yeah. Right. I Was mean, that something similar for you? In Tallinn, I, it really depends on the person, you know, right. you'll get like a couple of good replies and a couple of bad replies and you just got to seed them out and know. Right. But just like from the initial look, don't take everything you see to heart because some of them are just like, they have nothing better to do. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> but it's not just Tallinn. It happens in the Berlin group as well. That's why I was like, what's up with these expert groups, man? They're all crazy or what? Like, Facebook comments are going to be Facebook comments. Like, what do I you know, do? right? Keyboard warriors, all these people. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, but uh, but that aside, like, uh, I, I know, like, you know, following you on Facebook, I, I know that, you know, you took to life in Estonia, Estonia quite famously. So, um, you know, what has been your experience so far in the last two years? Well, it's kind of 
funny like uh, if i go to the startup scene then they'll all be if you mention singapore then they'll be like oh yeah this chick so it's it's funny like, are you like the only singaporean there? no of course not i know of another guy i've just never met him but uh i like to make this joke sometimes that like i'm not the first singapore in estonia but i think i might be the most famous one <laughs> So on a related note, like, do you get crazy rich Asians related jokes all the time? Surprisingly, no. <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I've I've never really gotten any crazy rich Asian joke actually. I'm not even. I mean, the movie play, and I went to watch it with a couple of my friends, and I told them like half of this is not real because after that they started asking me like, you know, can you like put it into perspective for us? What was it about it? Right. And I started telling this and that, this and that, and then yeah, most of all, I've never really gotten anything. But if there's something interesting to note, and uh, I'm not sure if you want to publish this, but I'm going to say it anyway. I've come to learn that Estonia and Europe can be quite racist. Okay. Um, and it's uh, not to... I've gotten a few things towards me, not anything majorly bad, because I've come to the point where I'm like, you can say what you want. I'm just not going to waste any energy being mad at you because there's no use in doing that. I'm not going to change your mind. Right. But when you see things happen to other people, it's quite sad. Like, I think, uh, I really can't remember exactly now, um, but there have been a couple of racist attacks against, like, I think the guy was from Pakistan. I'm really not sure. Okay. But um, he had, like, someone verbally abusing him and he took a video of that. And there were a couple of things going around. And so, yeah, it's a bit hard when you hear about such things. Of course, of course. Um, that said, is it is it racism or is it xenophobia in general? Because I do understand that xenophobia is kind of on the rise in most European countries. I think is it my, I'm similar? not sure entirely what it is either. But like the neo-Nazi party in Estonia did get into power. Wow. Okay. Wow. Yeah, right. it's because well, that one is a bit of a funny one. Like they didn't get enough seats in parliament, but the prime minister of Estonia wanted to keep his position so he made a deal with the devil which is the neo-nazi party just to keep his seat he didn't want to go do a coalition with the party that won because it meant that the female leader of that party would become prime minister and he wanted to hold on to his power so for doing that he's kind of done quite a bit of damage to the country yeah. but at least you know that this is what's going on and that's why all the more it's kind of done stuff. It's it's a bit crazy. Gosh, um, Nikki, like, is there any you know, risk to your personal safety? For me, I'm okay. It's right. just that right now, going back, I'm afraid that they might think I'm Chinese. Oh fuck yeah, that's. I mean, that's <sighs> a fact, man. To be honest, because I know what Estonia is like, and I know that when I speak English, they'll know that I'm definitely far from being a Chinese because of my level of English. But right. I am afraid that. I'm preparing myself, basically. Right. Hopefully, I don't get spat on or anything, because I'll probably punch that person. But uh, Fuck. I, mean. I, I mean, Estonia is is a tough one, and I just hope I'm preparing myself to be honest. But I'm in a city, so it might not be that bad. Right. But like, I really don't know how people are going to react when I get back. So, like, do you feel do you find that you know Tallinn is a lot more, let's say, um, liberal? Versus yeah, I think the cities, the cities are a bit more liberal. I feel, okay. but it also depends because Tallinn is like the major airport, so you do get, you know, they might not say anything; they'll just kind of like tolerate you, but they're not multicultural like Singapore, so it's a bit different like that. Interesting. Yeah, so it really depends on the person and the family and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I just hope that nothing's going to happen when I get back, or maybe I'll just quarantine myself or something. I don't know. <laughs> Shit. Yeah, no, I mean, the recent events, like, of the last couple of days has just been terrible. Like, the kind of I racist know. bullshit online is I know. ridiculous. And that's why, like, I'm a bit scared because the virus went to Finland and Finland's right above us as well. So I'm now, like, are they going to look at me like I'm Chinese and I'm just praying and hoping that it'll be okay. It's going to be a bit hard. Yeah, you know, fingers crossed it should be okay. I mean, maybe this is not the right time to tell you this but apparently a bunch of singaporean tourists were denied entry to a bunch of places in australia oh yeah yeah i know i saw that yeah i read about all of that as well so like fuck it has begun you know yeah so i mean yeah what can you do right that's why i'm just kind of like should i just not go out for a while i don't know man it's a tough one it's a tough one is this something that uh you know your other friends not from estonia feel too that one I don't know because okay. they haven't really said anything. But uh, 
yeah, we'll we'll see what happens and hope for the best. I mean, I hope that they can be better. Yeah, I mean, right now it's paranoia that's just ruling the roost. So it's yeah. I'm just hoping that the next couple of weeks, you know, things simmer down. And oh yeah, me too, me too, absolutely. Yeah. It's ridiculous what's happening right now. Tell me about it. So, yeah. Um, you know, on on the brighter side of things, <laughs> um, have you been, you know, having a good time living in Estonia? Yeah, you know, finding yeah. a crowd. Um, what do you generally like about living in Estonia that you don't find in Singapore? Um, I like. I like the quality of life I have there. I mean, I get a decent pay. I'm not, sh- I'm pretty sure it's quite decent what I get over there. So I live really well there. The city is really small, so you get everywhere like really fast. So I'm struggling a bit with Singapore. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, I get everywhere. Like if get. I have to travel <laughs> half an hour in Estonia, that's already not normal <laughs> for me. And also um, public transport, because I'm registered as a resident of Tallinn. Mm-hmm. I get free public transport in Tallinn. And wow. over here I have to pay. So it's a bit of a bitch. Like how does that work? Like everybody gets free transport if you're if living you're in regi- the city? If you're a citizen or you're registered as a resident of like Tallinn, then you get, you can... Uh, attach your green card which is your sort of like our easy link right. card to like your name and then they know that you're in the registry then you have to carry your id card with you so that in case they ask to check verify your id then you can prove it wow that's amazing so yeah free public transport we don't have any mrts we have trams and buses and we do have a train as well but yeah it's pretty cool um groceries and stuff they're fairly okay they're maybe even a bit more than berlin which does piss quite a number of people off the airport is nothing like singapore obviously that's a, that's a hard a, bar to yeah, talk to be honest i know right <laughs> we, ha- we have a small airport so we're a bit limited in flights and for someone like me who travels around a ton that took quite some getting used to to be like all right i'm kind of like, stuck but i have a very beautiful airport though i was very surprised at how cute and pretty it was okay. but number of flights and where it goes is like oh my god that like, you need to figure something out so instead of like traveling between countries, like do you generally do weekend trips? You know. Um, well, I mean, I, I find my way around. I, I find you know fairly good flights sometimes. Right. Um, yeah, okay. it depends on your luck, and I'm a pretty good flight searcher. So. So one of the things that I generally find, you know, uh, it's an opinion shared by a lot of Singaporeans who live overseas, is that you know, you know, when you live in a much much bigger country, there's like opportunities to go to the countryside oh yeah oh my god yes right like is that the same in estonia estonia's land size is 60 times of singapore approximately we did a little calculation between my teammate and i for the fun of it and they only have 1.4 million people there is so much space estonia doesn't have any hills it's mostly flat but there is an insane amount of space there and like almost every family has a summer house and i was like we can't even imagine owning a house in (laughs) singapore and every other family there has like one summer house and then it's like say for example the son or daughter gets married then they have a summer house as well and i'm like what the hell like everyone has a freaking summer house it's crazy and like the countryside oh beautiful beautiful the estonia is like uh known for their forests okay and it's just amazing like wow does estonia have is, is it like close to a body of sea a body of water yeah yeah so Tallinn is near like the sea so we can take right. a two-hour ferry to helsinki oh okay yeah. right oh that's awesome so it's and like, we have like 10 over ferries a day that go and I mean the big ones that take vehicles and stuff. Right. Yeah. So instead of flying, I mean, you know, transport by train. Um, uh, yeah, I guess you can take the train down to Latvia or like even to Russia and you can take the bus as well. So I've taken the bus to Latvia quite a few times. Right. Yeah, and to like St. Petersburg is like a seven hour bus. So you figure your way out. So as a Singaporean, like, can you go into... Um, you know, Russia without a visa? Um, yeah, right now, uh, I think as of October 2019, we are allowed to get into St. Petersburg. Uh, there are certain like ways of entry. You can get an online visa because they, um, they allow online visas for the Kaliningrad region, which is somewhere, like I think it's in between Lithuania and, and Poland, if I remember correctly. Okay. So the same 53 countries that are allowed the online visa for Kaliningrad now are allowed the same online visa for St. Petersburg. So, that's so that means I, I can finally go. I just haven't planned it. So I need to buck up and try and do something about it. But a long bus ride is not something I'm looking forward to. So Oh, well, I mean, you know. <laughs> you have to, like, Their buses are not like our buses to Malaysia, okay? If we have those buses, I wouldn't have a problem. 
Okay, okay. Like, are but they... they are like, like you know, one row has four seats. It's like the school bus kind of seats, and that isn't exactly very comfortable for seven hours. Oh well, <laughs> you have to have a trade off somewhere. So. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I need to figure that one out. Hello, hope you're enjoying the episode so far. Before we continue, I wanted to talk about another Singapore-based podcast which I really love. It's called SJ Explained, and it's a fantastic podcast for understanding the various social, cultural, and political institutions of Singapore. If you're new to Singapore, or if you're keen to learn more about the country, SJ Explained is the podcast you need to listen to. This is not a paid ad. I'm plugging this because I just love the podcast. Let's hear it straight from one of the hosts, Rovik himself. Wondering about what Singapore was like before Raffles came? How about the data around dating and why we may not be so hopeless in love after all? Or maybe you're lost about CPF and need an explainer about how it works. Being Singaporean isn't just about holding the passport. Join us on SG Explained, a regular podcast that gives you the lowdown about what it's like living on the red dot. Every episode, Elliot and I, there's Rovic for y'all, tackle a new institution, historical episode or phenomena and explain it uninvited commentary included. You'll be the smartest person at your next party, we swear. Give us a listen on all podcast platforms, including Spotify and Apple Podcasts. In case you forgot, that's SG Explained. See you there. Alrighty, so that was SG Explained, available on all podcast platforms. If you haven't given it a listen, check it out now, and hopefully you'll enjoy it as much as I do. Okay, so let's get back to living it up in Lion City. You need to know what is sort of native or something that they eat so often, whereby it's a very affordable cost. So you need to, each place has their own. So for example, in Estonia, they really love sour cream, potatoes, dill, and pork. Okay. So I can get like different cuts of pork for like really decent prices. Right. You just have to know. The names are a bit funny, obviously, because they're in Estonian. But when you look at it, you kind of roughly know what you're buying. Or I get my friend to go like, please translate this for me. Um, so you need to know kind of like what goes on in there. And like, yeah, I mean, if pork is cheaper there and I eat pork, then it's cool, you know. Right. So you right. need to kind of search like what is sort of more local to them. So how has your um, food, like dining and cooking experience been as compared to Singapore? Well, actually, to be honest, I used to cook a lot when I was a teenager as well, because I realized that if I were to cook, it was cheaper than the hawker center. Okay. All right. Yeah, I used to budget really well. So I knew like <laughs> what I was doing back then. So cooking has been something I've done for so a very we long suck time. At budgeting <laughs> yeah, I'm very good at budgeting how to cook decent food for really cheap as well. So um, I find that groceries turn out to be a lot more expensive than dining out. <laughs> so. It really depends on where you have to know what you're buying and where you go. Like I will travel to different places because I know this is cheaper, that is cheaper, or this has a good quality for a good price kind of thing. So. Yeah, I mean, of course, in Estonia, I've definitely done a lot more things from scratch because I'm like, damn, I need my chicken rice. Right. And surprisingly, chicken rice from scratch really isn't all that hard to do. I was quite surprised that like it was fairly easy enough, especially when you have a few friends to come around to help you. Right. So like preparing is one thing, but sourcing ingredients. You you mentioned something about a Thai supermarket, a Thai like. Oh, the Thai restaurant. Yeah, yeah, yeah they saved my life. But um. Yeah, it depends on what you need. Like, I already know what the Asian shops in Estonia sell. Right. And I know what's in the supermarkets now. So, like, when I'm back in Singapore, if someone is coming, I ask them to get stuff that I can't get over there. So even if the stuff I can get there is a bit more expensive and I can still get it here, I will get it there to save the space for something I can't get. Right. right. So, so yeah, like, I mean, balacha and chili, you can't get it there, man. So I bring the bottle over. I need it. That's true. <laughs> so, yeah, you have you have to know, and you have you know you have to know what you're doing and where to get things from, and what you're buying, and what is okay there, and what is not so okay there, and things like that. So that said, what is Estonian food like? Um, I know they have this sort of d traditional dish where it's like um, meat cream, minced meat cream sauce on potatoes. 
I actually haven't tried it because even the look of it for me is just like, I didn't grow up with dairy stuff mm -hmm. a lot. So a full on cream sauce like this just feels a bit too much yeah, for no, me personally. I um, yeah, I had lots of meat and potatoes. I've had that. And they have a lot of influence from Russia and Germany because these were countries that conquered them before. Right. So sauerkraut is actually part of their Christmas meal. Okay. And they know how to make some really damn good sauerkraut. And what I was surprised is in Estonia, some of them put pork in their sauerkraut, and I haven't seen that in Germany. So that's been quite nice, actually. Little meat in your, you know, sour cabbage and stuff. Interesting. Um, and then, yeah, they have quite a bit of influence from Russia. So pelmeni, which is the little Russian dumplings, you can get them like a whole frozen bag for like 150 or something. You just boil them up, and it's really uh, easy to eat and stuff. Um, yeah, they have yeah. black bread. I, it's a bit heavy, but quite nice at times. Like what's the, what's black bread like? I think it's made of rye. Okay. And uh, yeah, it's really good. There's this one uh, really good bakery called uh, Muhu Pagarit, which is Muhu is one of the islands, and Pagarit is like bakery, and they make amazing black bread. I just had to bring two loaves for an Estonian chick who lives here, and she was pretty much kissing me after that. She was like, thank you for my, <laughs> for my muhu bread. And I was like, don't worry. She probably had like tears were in her eyes. You know? Oh, yeah. And I heard that they, f I gave her two loaves, which is quite a decent size. And I heard that she and her boyfriend, who's Singaporean, but they finished it like really fast. That's what she told me. So when you're living in another place, you have this, um, you have this nostalgia for a food, you know, from where you yeah. come from. So is, is that one of the reasons why, you know, you started cooking a lot more in Estonia? Uh, yeah, also because, you know, the Asian food scene there just almost doesn't cut it or is more expensive than if I were to cook it myself. And I like specific tastes. So cooking it is like I get the taste and I save money. So it's right. kind of a win-win situation for me. About the Asian cuisine, like, is it a specific Asian cuisine? I don't know, man. It's just stuff that, like, I know how to make that I like right. that. It's sort of, I don't know, mixed Asian or something that mommy makes or something. And uh, I mean, like the yeah. Asian cuisine that's available in Estonia. Yeah. Like, is that a specific well, there's like, kind? There's an okay amount of Japanese food, actually. Right. And there's a little bit of Korean. And there's quite some Chinese, but Chinese is not Singapore Chinese. So right. okay. a lot of people tend to be like, oh, it's Chinese food. You should like it. I'm like, no, <laughs> Singapore Chinese food is quite different, guys. There's a little bit of Thai food going around. That's why when this shop opened, I was just like, you guys are the best. Like, they make Thai spicy. So when I go there now, somehow the chef will always find out that I'm ordering. Then the waitress will come back and be like, the chef is asking if you want normal spicy or Nikki spicy. Wow, okay. There's a Nikki spicy <laughs> level whereby the chef, like, makes me cry and, like, takes pride in the fact that she's made me cry. Is, is that something that... And it's good. Like, it's so good because it's, like, the flavor and the spice. Like, no matter how much she makes me cry, I still want to finish my bowl. Do your Estonian friends enjoy that level of spice? Oh, there is a spicy club in Estonia and there's quite a lot of Estonians and they can actually take more than I can. It's pretty crazy. Even when you're living in Singapore, like, you know, socializing and food is a big part of, you yeah. know, how you do Yeah, I mean, things, we did right? the barbecues, yeah. remember? Like, you know, right. 20 bucks each person and yeah. uh, everyone got really good meat. Yeah. So that's something that you're doing in Estonia too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, there are a couple of times where I've like done like bigger meals and I had like 10 people in my house. Is and it then, more like a potluck or does everyone no, come in like, and pitch in and cook? Yeah, some of them come early to help me cook and then some of them just come to eat, but they all help me to clean anyway. Um, yeah, I just go like, like this one time I made like this gigantic ass pot of Singapore curry. And I was like, guys, you all want to come? And they're like, hell yeah. Because they're always like, you know, they might not be very willing to try things like local Estonians. And I don't blame them because even for me going there, I was like, what is meat jelly? I can't eat meat jelly. They like it there. What is meat jelly? Like jelly with meat. I'm not kidding. In a container and it's sold in the supermarket. Like gelatin and meat together? Yeah, yeah, like jelly. I, I can't do that. I'm, I told them, guys, I'm really sorry. I can't I can't bring myself to do that. <laughs> kind of intrigued now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, my, my jelly has to be sweet, not savory. I can't. I just can't. But like uh, when I tell them, like they all, like surprisingly, they all want to try some form of Asian food. And when there's someone that they know and they trust you, then they're like, okay, bring it on. And um, I mean, of course, I know where the limit is. And I had some of them go like, we really want to try the real stuff. I'm like, okay, fine. You 
So I, one of my friends, I gave them Teochew porridge, which is like a plain rice porridge, and we have all these condiments and stuff. So I gave him full on. I gave him the fermented shrimp omelette. I gave him the fermented bean curd, pickled lettuce, um, salted eggs. I gave him the the whole shebang. And after that, he was like, actually, I really enjoyed that. So they kind of, like some of them who are more daring, they like bring it on. And then the others, I just make things they know, like chicken or fish. And I'm like, okay, you should try it. It tastes like this and that. And they're like, okay, we trust you. We're going to eat it. And they go like, oh my God. And then they finish the whole thing. You have become the window to Singaporean cuisine in Estonia. Yeah, I think a decent amount of Asian food. I have introduced quite a number of people to it. I've even done like vegan stuff and things like that. And they're like, what? Like, this is really cool. And because I try to explain like, this is what it is to them. This is how I made it. You know, I'm not forcing you to try it. But if you want to try just a spoon, it's right here. So they're, yeah, most of them are really open. Like anytime I have extra lunch at work, there's always someone who's like, yeah, give it to me. Um, thanks for the free lunch. Well, that's awesome. And I think like as a foreigner, because, you know, I asked you before about, you know, advice to, you know, someone who is moving to a new country mm-hmm. for the first time. What I generally tell people is about, you know, like if you have, um, you know, do something with friends or with people that you know around food, it's it's actually like a really great social experience and allows you to bond better. With oh, people. yeah, yeah. Because I mean, you know? like when we do chicken rice, I'll just be like, guys, because like, some of my friends have come a few times for chicken rice now. I'm like, you all know that the chicken involves a one hour waiting period where I don't want to sit by myself. And they're like, no, 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 we're coming, we're coming. <laughs> with a bottle of wine and, you know. Yeah, yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> like, you know, that's what they do. So they'll be like, all right, here we are. And then I'll, I'll be like, okay, I need to chop this, so this is what you have to do with the chicken. And they're like, okay, all right. And then they actually like do like the dipping of the chicken in the hot water because you need to stretch out the chicken skin and stuff. We follow this recipe, so they all kind of know. Like, It looks a bit weird when you're like holding the chicken by the legs and dipping it in and out, but like, you, you kind of have to do that. But that's that's part of the friendship bonding experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, they, all, they all like it. Like It's pretty fun. And sometimes I'll just be like, Guys, there isn't anything extra to see. It's just stir frying, but I need your help to come chop the veggies and they'll all come and chop the veggies. Oh, and we do hot pot. I love hot pots, but oh my goodness, the prep work is crazy. So much chopping is absolutely insane. I'm like, guys, you want it? You all come and chop. And all the chopping boards and plates will come out and like everybody has to chop something and right. stuff like that. So, yeah. So, Nikki, like one of the things that I've noticed, at least in the, the time that I've been living here in Singapore, is that, you know, um, you know, I enjoy eating and stuff and I enjoy like, you know, socializing around it. Um, so, you know, I tend to go to like, you know, potlucks and stuff where yeah. you bring food together. Whereas what I've noticed about, you know, when I talk to friends who live elsewhere, it's all about cooking together. Like, do you feel that? Oh, there's difference? a mix. There's a mix. Like when I went to my friend's place for Christmas, she told me that everyone who comes brings a dish. Right. So when Derek, our friend, came to visit me, I told Derek, I was like, Derek, we're going to Christmas and we have to bring a dish. So we made like curry fried chicken, which they were like, whoa, this is amazing. And so we were so happy that they loved it. Um, so yeah, it really depends. Like the previous Christmas, I did the appetizer, like I did a hot and sour soup. And then my friend did the main course with the pork and sauerkraut. So it, it really depends. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. Like there are times where like we'll bring our food and there are times where like someone cooks and we go help them kind of thing. So it's a mix. I mean, you go to barbecues and everyone brings their food, you know, everyone brings meat, salads and stuff. And then you take turns on the grill and things like that. So, yeah, it's a whole mix. Is there something in Estonia or is there something that you miss, um, you know, living in Estonia that you would get in Singapore? Laksa. Ah, right. I need my laksa. Is it something that you can make? Uh, I Surprisingly, the supermarket sells the laksa paste, which really surprised me. But then obviously I don't get my cockles or my bean curd or my fish cake. So I do it with like some random noodles and cucumber and uh, chicken and eggs and stuff like that. It's sort of like a well. Estonian version of Singapore laksa because <laughs> it's the best that I can do. So, But at least I get the soup, which is... That, that is that is part of the food yeah yeah it's part of the whole thing and, yeah and so like you know that. it is what it is <laughs> i mean i miss being able to just like go downstairs and go across the street and be like oh my god i got my three dollars chicken rice kind of thing you know i don't get that anymore is uh dining out something that a lot of estonians and you know you live in i mean you can do it fairly easily and i like you know i know a few places like there's my thai place and there's this other place called 160 that sells like really good smoked meats and stuff i love it over there you just have to know where to go um yeah, but I mean, it's still cheaper for me to cook it at home. So what would you consider a difference? Like, what's the difference between you cooking in Singapore versus you cooking in, in Estonia? Like, are there limitations in Estonia? Are there things in Estonia that 
you have that you wouldn't have in Singapore? Well, it's more of that I can get all the things I want for what I want to make in Singapore really easily. In Estonia, sometimes it's a big, a bit of a hunt to go get what I want. Like, uh, for example. Like if I want to make wontons, for example, I can just go to the fair price and they all have the skins ready the right. available. Whereas like if I want to make it in Estonia, I got to go specifically to the Asian shop, which is a bit of a trip and get like their skins in order to make something. So right. in that sense, yeah. Is, is there a big Asian community in Estonia? I'm not so sure about that one. Okay, I think there's a decent number, but... I mean, you're you're 50% of the Singaporean population in Tallinn, so... I, w- <laughs> I heard there are a few more. I have heard about them. I haven't met them, but yes, I have heard there are a few more. So uh, I was reading this uh, some, uh, from some, some place that, um, as it turns out, there's about like 250,000 Singaporeans living overseas all across the world. That's not exactly a lot. Yeah, and uh, most of them actually live in Malaysia and Australia. So the number of people living in... Uh, EU in general would be less than 5,000 as it turns out. Really? (laughs) (laughs) Okay. That explains why they're like like a super minority. (laughs) So curious about me all the time. It's very funny. Like when I'm there and they'll ask me like where I'm from and I say Singapore and they're like, what are you doing here then? Then when I'm back in Singapore, they're like, where are you again? I say Estonia. What are you doing there? Apparently there's something about this shock that isn't ending anytime soon. So what are the perceptions of... um that Estonian people have about Singapore? I think they see Singapore at a pretty high level, to be honest. Like, yeah, Singapore has a certain status yep. amongst them, which yeah. is quite interesting to see. Was this pre crazy Rich Asians or post crazy Rich Asians? Both. Okay, okay. Yeah, but I don't even think that Crazy Rich Asians did much to really change. Maybe it gave them a bit more of an impression, but like, right. if you ask around the startup scene, they all knew. Okay. Yeah, they're just like, what? Like, what are you doing here? And they're like, why would you come here and leave Singapore? Well, I yeah. mean, here we could see a huge difference. Like, you know, there, there are these walking tours now. They're called Crazy Rich Asians walking tours. Oh, I've heard about that <laughs> yeah. stuff. Oh, my like, God. Uh, last year, some of my colleagues from the U.S. came down and we were going around and my colleague was like, yo, you know, my wife wants all of the pictures from all of the locations that are shown in Crazy Rich Asians. Can you take me there? And I was like, oh, okay, all right. Yeah, you know, so let's, let's, let's go to Celavi. Yeah, yeah. sure. <laughs> I mean, so. I know it's one of those things. So I always thought, I'm like, okay, if you come here, then there's the Wednesday night ladies night. This is what you have to do because it's a legit money saving move. And I'm all about saving money. So, you know, things like that. And wow. I also always send people to my favorite Peranakan shop in Maxwell. Which one is that? It's called Popo and Nana's. Is that a shop or a stall? Yeah, it's a Maxwell? stall in Maxwell. Yeah. Okay, right. Yeah, because okay. I went there on Friday and the auntie was like, hey, your friends have been coming around here. I was like, auntie, I know. I send them here every single time because I know that you would feed them and take care of them. And Peranakan cuisine is so different from a lot of the other Singapore food that most people wouldn't even come across at all. So part of introducing that, of course, is to bring auntie some business. But also to show them that like there's more than what you yep. think there is here. I always get texts going like, oh my God, you have no idea what I just ate, but it was just freaking amazing. I'm like, told you so. Yeah. Like I think there's a there's a very prevalent assumption that, you know, Singaporean cuisine is just chicken rice or laksa and stuff yeah, like and that. And chili crab and all of that yeah, stuff. I'm like, there's too. so much more. Yeah, like, have like you actually spectrum. gone to try the proper Malay nasi padang and things like that? Like we friend of mine and I brought some to our Russian girlfriend's place yesterday and I'm, I think that might have been the first time she ever tried it. But she was like, bring it on. And oh, she was eating the snails right out of the shell. Yeah, and I think that's something that people need to do, right? I think my favorite part about traveling is also about eating. Absolutely. You know? I yeah. love when people like just take me somewhere. I'm like, I can sit on a little chair by the side street as long as you give me stuff. Like when I was in Romania, they were like, oh, we're going to take you to this place to eat michi, which are these minced meat. Uh, grilled minced meat sausages and it's freaking amazing and they're like oh the place is kind of run down we hope you don't mind i'm like nah man take me there (laughs) and then i went there and it was like proper wooden like benches and tables and stuff and i was like you guys call this rundown they're like yeah and i'm like you guys have not seen asia's version of rundown man like we sit in the back alley on little chairs and eat our vietnamese food but we love it because it's just real 
So it was quite cute that they were like, oh, you know, this is a bit run down. I'm like, no, it's not. This is like luxury already. You have a proper bench and table, you know. Does this mean that in Estonia, there isn't much of a street food culture? Not much, actually. We get like some uh, outdoor fairs and stuff during the spring and summer. And there are like food trucks. Right. And there's this one permanent food truck in Teleskivi, which is sort of the hipster district. And that's about as much like sort of street food that we have. Okay. Yeah, we don't even have that many kebab places or anything like that. So 24-hour food is a bit of a problem. Whoa. Yeah. Wait, so what happens after like, you know, five o'clock in the morning when you stumble out of a bar? Good luck to you. There ain't no food around. (laughs) There are a couple of 24-hour supermarkets, but I also have this thing that my kitchen has or my fridge has to be. I wouldn't say massively stocked to a decent amount that like anytime I want food, I can get it. So yeah. Right, so it's like you stumble out of a bar, you manage to get back home, and then you just have to like cook something up. Yeah, Indomie. Oh, right, of course, yes, the good old faithful. <laughs> I always make sure that you have um, a, a carton of eggs in your fridge because that goes with your Indomie very well, you know, crack the eggs, that kind of thing. I fed Indomie to my drunk friends and they're like, girl, what magic is this? I'm like, the magic is called Indomie, yo. It is magical. It is. Magical. I know, right. And also a funny, not funny, a very interesting fact about Estonia is that microwaves are not a huge thing there. Okay. Um, it, it Microwaves are common in offices and co-working spaces, but not in households. So yes. I do not have a microwave. For someone who has come from Singapore, not having a microwave, at first I was like, oh my goodness, this is going to take some getting used to. But surprisingly, if I've actually survived and been really good without the microwave, with this like regular gas stove and yeah yeah I have, I have well I mean I have an electric hob and right. then uh, I bring my lunch to work and then I heat it up in the microwave at work but in my place even if I have like leftover rice I just heat it up on the stove and stuff and it really isn't that hard so it's quite interesting that they're like at home some some houses do of course but it's not like as common as cities in like Singapore to have microwaves that's interesting because it's it's a ubiquitous part of the kitchen, in my opinion. But. Yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> it's like, I think in Singapore, one of the top three things that you get for someone who moves in is like kettle, microwave, toaster, you know? <laughs> Whereas like over there, it's like a kettle is a big thing, of course. Everyone needs the hot water. But then uh, the microwave part kind of shocked me even. I was like, what? And then, like I said, I thought I had a problem. But no. It's actually been fairly okay. Sometimes it does annoy me because I'm just like, oh, I just want to put it there and not have to worry about the heat. You know, I'm just put three minutes and that's it. Go to the bathroom, come out, my food is done. But at other times I'm just kind of like, oh, it really, it's, all right. it's not that bad actually. <laughs> like, you know, it's, yeah. So that's a fun fact that like microwaves really are not a huge thing there. In so, fact, they try not to use it. So for all the culture shocks, like that's the one that... <laughs> shocks you the most? I wouldn't say it shocked me the most. <laughs> Actually, I'm not even sure what shocked me the most, to be honest. Um, I They have crab sticks over there okay. in the supermarket, okay. very readily available. And that was a bit like, you guys have crab sticks? You eat that here too? Oh, okay. That was something. You don't have dumpling skins, but crab sticks. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you guys got crab sticks. All right, sweet ass, you know, like, this is cool. Oh, and also seafood. I think that one was a bit, I wouldn't say culture shock. That was more of a foodie shock for me because we have the sea right there at Tallinn. But the, the seafood is just like not very good. And a lot of it's frozen from somewhere else. So really, that okay. was a bit of a shock for me. Yeah, I being near the sea, I did not expect that. Okay. So. Yeah. So we get like okay seafood. I mean, I'm you know I don't have access to suppliers like the restaurants do, so it does get a little bit hard right. for seafood, especially when I love my prawns and fish, and I'm like, I just want some fish curry, please. Wow. So like, so in general, Estonian cuisine is mostly meat, potatoes, and yeah, yeah, dairy. lots, lots of um, pork. I mean, of course, there's chicken and beef, lamb, but mostly pork. And speaking of uh, Estonian cuisine, if there's one dish that you would recommend anyone to have if they visit Estonia, what would that be? I would say go have some muhu bread. That black bread is just epic. But you have to get it from muhu bakery, which is muhu bakery, because that's like the best one. Just go there, get half a loaf or a whole loaf and just share it. It's really, really good. Another thing I also really recommend is what is called kohupi makuk, which translates to curd cake and pisses me off because curd cake just doesn't sound nice in English. It just doesn't. 
<laughs> like curd cake. I mean, seriously, if I were to come up to you and say, hey, you want some curd cake? You'd be like, uh, yeah, uh, okay. yeah not really. <laughs> but in Estonia, it just sounds like Kohupi Makuk, which is like such a nice name. And so I had some friends uh, visit and she was like, I was like, guys, you need to go have Kohupi Makuk. And then I introduced her to that. And she went to the supermarket and found it. And this is like some factory made version. Okay. And she ate it and she was like, girl, if someone were to make this for real, she's like, I would just probably die and go to heaven because she only had that basic one and she was like, this is so good. So curd cake is exactly what it is? It's yeah, so kohu pim because there's a huge dairy industry in Estonia and right. kohu pim is like curd and they use it in a bunch of different things and you can use it to make cake. Something I need to learn how okay. to do that. Um, but yeah, the cake is really good. Like really, really good. I've had some friends make homemade versions and one of my teammates, she came to my house for hot pot and she made us a raspberry coconut one. And I was like, girl, so good. Noted for future reference. Yeah. Definitely but don't it. go asking for curd cake because they'll be like, what are you talking about? Because it's a literal translation. Okay. I can tell you again when you come. But All right. Yeah. yeah. Kohupi Makuk is just, yeah, it's traditional to them and it's just so good. So, so good. What do you miss the most about Singapore? The food. I mean, I love my family and friends, but they do come to visit. The food, man, the food does not come to visit. <laughs> does not happen. I always miss the food. I, I, and it's I not totally just understand. Estonia. Like <laughs> anytime I travel, I'm just like, oh my God, the food. Um, yeah, I think I, when I was in Frankfurt, like, I w there was like a Malaysian restaurant and I was just stuffing my face there. Um, I have noticed that Malaysian restaurants are quite popular in a lot of European cities. Yes, and they, I mean, they're very similar to, you know, they sell laksa, they sell chicken rice, I'm like, bring it on. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Um, food aside, is there anything that you struggle with that you wouldn't generally deal with in Singapore, for example? Hmm... No, I can't really think of anything off the top of my head, actually. Maybe because I think I adapt to places fairly well. So for me, I wouldn't say that there's anything that really sticks out that like, oh, I can't like do it. Because when you talk about like work, working styles, you know, you just kind of learn how to deal with that. Yeah. So I, yeah, I, I don't think there's been anything overly massive. Like, as, a, as an example, like, the one thing that I miss most is, uh, you know, having my own set of wheels. Like, when I was living oh, in India, okay. you know, just having a bike. So I used to ride a motorbike and right. something as simple as waking up at three o'clock in the morning, feeling like I want to eat something. I just, you know, jump on my bike, go somewhere, eat something. And that, that's something that I don't have in Singapore. So it's like, when I go traveling, most of the time, I try to rent a bike because it's right, like, that's right. something that I really want to do. Um, is there something similar that you have that you generally do in Singapore that you can't do? Out there 24 hour food places man <laughs> yep it's always about the food <laughs> yeah I, like like honest to goodness i really can't think of anything that i do here that is massively different from how i do it somewhere else okay. you know but i yeah it's always about food for me man come on Rindo, you know that <laughs> you know every, anything else you you adapt that's true that's i true. mean i guess the weather I wouldn't say it was a shock because you do your research and you know what you're in for. But when you're really there, it's like, okay. It's like, I, I think when it got to minus 18, feels like minus 30, that definitely. Wow. Okay. I wouldn't say it shocked me massively. More of just like, oh my God, I'm going to have to find a way to survive. Um, because I already knew that this was highly possible. Right. So. But still, you can mentally prepare yourself as much. The physical code is another question altogether. But then when you're there, there's only two options. Either you survive or you don't survive, you know. So you make yourself do it. I've heard this thing, I, I believe it is in Sweden or something, where it's like the colder it gets, the more you try to find activities to do with friends. You know, because the cold can get you down, or at least that's Yeah, what I think said. it depends on the person that you try to find something. And a lot of the things they try to tell you to do is like embrace the cold. So you try and go for like little walks and things like that. Go exploring like 
my friends and I went to see like this waterfall that was half frozen, which was really, really cool. And we couldn't stay out there for too long, like 10 minutes and you're running back into the car. But the point is you did something in the cold together. It was a nice day. It wasn't like rainy or anything. So, you know, At you do things 18, like that. I would stay in the car. Like, I wouldn't go out. Oh, no, when I went to the <laughs> waterfalls, it wasn't that bad. But like there was like one week where it was like minus 18 feels like minus 30. And I was wearing like three pairs of pants and walking around like a ball of fluff because I had all these clothes around me. But, you know, you do your research about this thing. So I wasn't, I mean, of course, it was a bit of a shock to my bones. But after that, you just have to survive. So mentally, I knew, but physically, it was just like, okay, I'm in it now. But I wouldn't say it was like a crazy shock because you know that this is that's, what you're in for. That's so. true. I mean, I, you do get used to winter, but it's like I always struggle with the notion of if I want to go out, I have to wear like three layers of clothing. Oh, yeah, yeah. I would. I mean, yeah, that wasn't a shock. It was just more annoying. <laughs> but I kind of got used to it now. So I'm just like, okay, whatever. You know, like it's just more annoying. It was, it's just like, oh my God. And then sometimes you realize you wear too many layers and you're legit sweating underneath and you just like learn your lesson from that as well. So yeah, it's not. Like, it hasn't been, like, a big shock. It's just been, like, learning points that you, you know, you learn how to adapt. There was this one thing. This was many, many years ago in Germany. Um, like, we went to a bar, and they have, like, this rack overhead where you put all your jackets, right? So you wear all your jackets. You get inside the bar. You take them all off, and you can put it on top of this rack. And then by the end of the night, everybody's drunk as fuck. And then everybody takes a different jacket back home. And they have a Facebook group specifically for this. You know, it's like, oh, hey, yeah. guys, there's this pink woolly jacket. Whose is it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's fairly normal. <laughs> like, one of the clubs I go to, they had this uh, Lost and Found album the other day. And it really made us laugh because there was someone else underwear there. As you do in the club, you know. <laughs> so Of course. <laughs> that, that, was really, that one was really funny because I, I can't remember how the underwear looked. But it made everyone go like... <laughs> what like okay all right well at least someone had a good time yeah apparently so but yeah i I wouldn't say anything's been like a a major shock or anything like you know i know they speak estonian i roughly knew about their personality and uh you just go by yeah as a foreigner you always have to ask yourself you know it's like yeah yeah there's a there's this um dilemma that you have like you know do you want to put your roots here or do you want to move somewhere else exactly and then the longer you live in a place it's like the more it feels like home and nikki like uh, you know personally um, i just came back from india you mm-hmm. know i just came back today and you know i left india close to a decade ago okay and when i went back you know it is not the india that i know anymore you know so it's like it got to the point where, like, when I came back to Singapore and, you know, the airport, there's that welcome, yep. you know, when you put in your passport. Yep. Like, when they showed that sign, welcome, Rindu Ramakuti, I was like, oh, I had this, you know, visceral feeling of, you know, being at home. Right. Right. So I struggle with that because, like, I am Indian. I identify as Indian. Like, you know, India is my home. Mm-hmm. But with every passing year, I realize that, you know, it's it's so far away from what I used to yep. know about India. Um when I talk to uh, people from India who moved recently or from elsewhere and, you know, I struggle to identify with the country that they're talking about, mm-hmm. you know? Um, I mean, like, is it something that you, um, you know, uh, obviously you've, you've been living only for like two years, but you have been living elsewhere before. Yeah. Like, as a foreigner, do you find that, do you, ha- do you ask yourself that question? Uh, I don't know. Like, I mean, I see the changes in Singapore, but... Right doesn't i'm just like okay cool get along just go with it um home for me for the longest time now has been a feeling and not a place so until it becomes a place then we shall see but that's true that's true but yeah i mean you know to each their own so yeah i mean every time i come in like oh okay this is new that is new but then again everyone knows singapore changes so fast so i'm not exactly very surprised either like, uh, I mean, there are places I went to as kids and stuff that is no longer there. And you just kind of, you know, there's only so much you can do about it. So, Well, Nikki, you're yeah. a lot more adaptable than I am, I guess. Like, I used to think of myself as not someone who gets homesick a lot. But this trip, I, I was like, f- what is this place? You I, know, get just... <laughs> I get food sick. I get food sick. <laughs> Massively. Massively. Or like my form of homesick is like, I miss my mommy. Not like I miss Singapore, but I miss my mom. And that's quite different from missing the country. Course, so, yeah. yeah. Uh, do you see yourself um, living in Singapore? No. Okay. <laughs> All right. So that's, that's, a, 
that's one thing that you're sure of. Oh, I've been sure of that since I was a kid. Okay. I just knew that Singapore is a great place, but it's just not the place for me. Right, right. It's, uh, I've, I've had this conversation with you a number of times. I remember like, yeah. having this conversation with you way back in 2014 when you were in uh, Auckland. Yeah, I yeah. Think it was, yeah it's, it's oh, and you slept consistent. on my couch in the <laughs> pink blanket. I still need to dig up that photo, <laughs> one of the best blackmail photos. Yeah, it's, it's still there in, one of the, <laughs> in that group. And me and my blue hair next to my car, oh my God, in my pink bathrobe. Oh my goodness, classic memories. Uh, speaking of the car, like, um, you know, do you do you go around um, no, in Estonia? No, I haven't driven a car in five years, so it's not safe for me to be on the roads right now. I'm Obviously, a very good passenger. Yeah. It's it's a very different take from when you were living in, in Auckland, yeah? Because you'd need a car there. Oh, yeah, in Estonia, I mean, we have Bolt, you know, which is like our grab, so I get around fairly easily for under five euros, so... But then public transport is free, so I tend to go buy that as best as I can, you know, try to help the environment a little bit. Of course, of yeah. course. Um, do Estonians generally travel around in cars? Um, yeah, there's a decent number of cars there. It doesn't mean they use it all the time. Like I have friends who uh, park their cars and then use it only when they need it kind of thing, so it depends. Okay, yeah. okay. All right. Um, okay, I think that's all I have, really. Um, cool. Okay, so we'll wrap I need the up. bathroom now. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's, let's head out. Let's head to beer. Stop, yeah. <laughs> um, all right, so on that note, Nikki. Yes. Thank you so much for being part of this again. Always, always. <laughs> and hopefully this time. No, I mean, for sure, this time I have it all captured. Thank God. So. <laughs> if not you would have to wait till December or we're going to have to do some Skype calls and stuff. <laughs> we will do that. Like there's, there's a food part that I want to cover. Sure, later we can, we can do that. Right, so folks, that was Nikki. Um you know, about her experience as a Singaporean living in Estonia. Um, my name is Rindo. And Nikki. And this is Living It Up in Lion City. Woo! Ciao. Bye. All right. Bye.